my old buddy John Large over at Red Dice Diaries has been talking about Sly Flourish recently. He's picked up the return of the Lazy Dungeon Master and been trying out some of the techniques. Jason Connolly of Nerds RPG Variety Cast has also picked up on this and mentioned it a couple of times. So I thought, do you know what? I'm going to go back into the archive and create a remix of episodes 110 and 111 to condense my thoughts into a more concise and easy to digest episode. I discuss my respect for Mike's ideas and talk about how I've used them in my own games. I hope you enjoy. The chief reason for doing these retread remixes is so that I can put something together that is self-contained, hoping that it will stand the test of time a little bit better once it's out in the wide world. Ever since I started podcasting, I didn't really know how to make these episodes cohesive. And recently, I've come up with an idea of putting things onto the uh, Spike Pit Patreon, working with the pit crew over there. We exchange messages. From all of that discussion and sharing of ideas, I put together a kind of more collaborative, self-contained episodes. An example would be the community episode that I released. Going forward, if this is something that you'd like to get involved with, I urge you to take a look, check out the Spike Pit Patreon, come and join us. In the meantime, let's talk DM Prep the Lazy Way. It's game night tonight, folks, and I want to talk a, a little bit about prep. Now, when I talk about prep, that means basically one thing. That means I'm going to be talking about Sly F Flourish and the Lazy Dungeon Master. Or, more accu accurately, Return of the Lazy Dungeon Master. I think it's quite fair to say that uh, Mike's work and his blog, uh, slyflourish.com, has probably been one of the biggest influences on me since my return to running games. I picked up the original Lazy Dungeon Master, thoroughly enjoyed it, found it a real eye-opener. His, his latest offering I backed as a Kickstarter, one of the very few Kickstarters that I've ever done. And it does not disappoint me. There's a, a few key points that I always use. First up, I've got like a, a summary sheet that I use that's got the players, characters in summary. I'll be having a little look through that, checking up on my notes before the session. So re-familiarise myself with the names. I mean, they haven't really got any abilities, but just, you know, the composition of the party, just get that in my mind. Between sessions, I'm thinking about secrets and clues. This is the spice that is sprinkled through the session. Just little snippets of perhaps campaign world or narrative stuff, possibly developing the background of the characters a little bit. And some of these secret secrets and clues I might use in my post-game texts to players. If something comes up in the session that I don't think all the characters would pick up on, I might save that till after the session and then fire it on a text. Mike stresses the fact that you don't want a whole bunch of these things piling up. So you kind of, the ones that don't, come into existence or are undiscovered you just leave them to one side and maybe forget about them and if you remember them bring them up in a future session don't don't try and keep a log of all these things and the third thing that i do is think about the start the get the get the start of the session off to a flying start a strong start that could be you know 
bashing into a combat or a reveal or some sort of cutscene or or anything you like. But as Mike says, this is the only part of the session that you've actually truly got some sort of control over. And depending on how you look at that, even even that could be limited. That's probably the single most biggest thing that gives me the confidence to to run the game. If I know I've got a good start, I've got some secrets and clues, and um, I've familiarised with myself with the characters and, and, and what they're about. For me, that's the big three or the holy trinity, if you like. And we all know three is the magic number. So that's what I had to say in episode 110. We're now going to dive a little bit deeper as I explore further in episode 111. So the preparation process basically amounts to a checklist that Mike's come up with. Uh, There's eight points on it, so I'm just going to list them quickly. Review the characters, create a strong start, outline potential scenes, define secrets and clues, develop fantastic locations, outline important NPCs, choose relevant monsters, and select magic item rewards. Now, when you read Mike's book, each of those separate items is dealt with in its own section. He introduces with a kind of an overview of each, then goes into a bit more detail. And then each section has a summary in it with the the main takeaway points. I found that really helpful. It suited my style of learning. I I, I don't mind learning from books. Uh, He gives examples. There's not masses of stuff to get your head around he's really uh, made it concise and he gets to the point quickly without a lot of messing about and and flowery language the other thing he does is he talks about a quick prep so there's this five minute preparation and that is a little bit closer to how i've been approaching it of late i don't need to develop the fantastic locations for example because i'm running a, the uh, tomb of the serpent kings i don't have to outline so much the important npcs the relevant monsters are already included so there's quite a few of these steps magic items etc that i can leave out so his five minute preparation is create a strong start which i definitely do i mean it's obvious it's the start it's what you can control that that's what I think about. Uh, if I have to ring wing it for the rest and improvise, so be it. If it goes off at a tangent, you know, at least if I if I've thought about some of the the starting action, I might have half an hour, maybe even an hour's play there, just in my head. Then the second step of the five minute prep is the the secrets and clues. Mike is a massive fan of that idea, and so am I. In this session on Tuesday, I think I managed to drop about three of those in. I had 10 in total and I had 10 the session before and I swapped them. I think I swapped them all out. I I kept the discipline. I threw away last session's list, wrote a new list for this session. I think just coming up with that list is a good exercise in its own right. So I can highly recommend that secrets and clues. And then the third one in the five minute preparation is develop fantastic locations. And his reason for having that on there is it can be difficult to come up with some real nice, interesting locations on the fly. Of all the stuff, in his opinion, that's probably the hardest thing to do. No surprises, he does have a uh, a book that he produced called that Fantastic Locations. I can thoroughly recommend that as well. If, you, if you're a little bit tight for time, it's a good thing to throw into your GMing bag. It's 20 very different fantastic locations. And I, I might have to talk about that further in, a, in another episode because I, I do like that. I um, started off with a PDF and just recently picked up the hard copy b- because um, I printed it out small and... You know, there's some some nice, colourful artwork in there, and I, I didn't think my copy really did it justice. And also, I wanted to get a hard copy, you know, just to support Mike Shea a little bit because I've been so impressed with his work. 
basically I've quickly described the technique for you there. What I want to do now is explain how I changed that slightly, modified it to work into my method and my circumstances for this last session. Okay, so I'm halfway into an adventure, probably, maybe a bit more, four sessions in. We've had some fatalities and characters are a little bit cautious. I've had to work in a new character that's come into the adventure owing to a fatality. No, yeah, I've had to do two of those. They've, they've both basically wandered into the front of the tomb for various different reasons. His eight-point checklist starts with reviewing the characters, and that's what I went through. I've only run four sessions with these guys. With you know, with two fatalities, we're getting new blood in the term in terms of characters coming into the group. So I'm not as familiar with the party as I would be in a longer running campaign. I review them first of all, so that I can, if I'm if I'm improvising, I can work in some sort of ideas that that are relevant to the party and all that sort of thing. So it's a good thing, yeah. Just even simply knowing the names of the characters, then I started thinking about my strong start. In the previous session, the thief had put on this um, magic item. I won't go into details, but it was causing him some health issues, shall we say. Unfortunately, that player, it's uh, our friend Carl, was not available for the session. This worked out okay. As his character was feeling unwell, I was able to sort of sideline him a little bit and also present the other characters with a sort of a, a little bit of a, a moral dilemma. He ended up with a finger removed. I won't go into details because of spoilers, but that that kind of little story played out through the whole session and it was a nice little bit of drama. My prep lined me up for that and I got straight in at the start talking about how the how Kyle's character, the thief, was feeling unwell and um, you know it's a good example of how that strong start buoyed me up and kind of carried me through the session. Secrets and clues. One of, one of the first secrets came up very early in the se session. It was to do with some of the inhabitants that the uh, the group are calling griblies. I like the idea of not kind of calling out the truth. You know, um, let, the, let the party think up names for the stuff they encounter. And then I adopt their name going forward. I think... You know, that's kind of what would happen if you run into something you've never run in, into before. You're going to pretty soon come up with a nickname or you're just going to call them whatever. And I like to carry that on through. So I've adopted that title, the Griblies. Everybody knows what it means. And I think it's a, a pretty cool little name that um, they came up with. So we discovered as one of the secrets that these guys are looking for a king and there was kind of some role playing interaction in a, in a kind of a, dra a, drama a dramatic play acting kind of way between the party and the griblies and that kind of soured about midway in the session and um yeah uh hostilities eventually broke out yeah so that was one of the one of the secrets i'm just trying to think of another secret um no it escapes me but it's not important but like i say i had 10 secrets I used free in session. That's another lazy DM technique that served me well. They're my free core when it comes to running um, prepared published stuff. Sly Flourish also talks about building a lazy campaign. So I want to move into that a little bit. And he is a, a big fan of reskinning published material in this scenario i've reskinned a couple of the encounters to make them fit a little bit more with the theme that i intend using i'm i'm leaning on this sort of snake man type of idea one of the monsters in particular has been reskinned he talks about developing a spiral campaign that's another thing that i'm doing i'm starting with the this location and the Morgan's Fort setting in the Western Lands for Basic Fantasy RPG. And then I've got all the other uh, Basic Fantasy published material that can then spiral out around from this central starting point. Depending on the hooks and ideas that the players come up with, that will 
put direction into the into the campaign. Based on the emergent stories that have come from the characters, I've looked at the campaign setting, I've taken their stories and I've come up with six truths for the campaign. This is item four on the building a camp a lazy campaign list. And then following that you've got defining three fronts, incorporating goals and grim portents. Because we haven't done much adventuring or any adventuring outside of the tomb and we've only just talked about raids on the caravan and stuff, I'm leaving the fronts a little bit sketchy at the moment. I've got one front really that's developing. I talked about the hobgoblins and the raiders on the caravan and there's a sort of a, a front there. Plus probably there'll be some sort of a front at Morgan's Fort just to do with really being on the edge of the frontier and stuff like that. And then a third front that I can see developing is perhaps to do with this snake man theme, this ancient civilization. It's really the grim portents, the sort of like the bad stuff that could happen if these fronts are ignored. That's the bit I need to develop a little bit further. I've got some goals in mind for those fronts. And I love fronts. It's uh, something... I picked up, as I mentioned before, from Dungeon World and um, Perilous Wilds. That is about it for me on on the Building a Lazy campaign. It's the reskinning, the spiral campaign, a, a campaign hook focusing on a single major goal, which currently is like getting to Morgan's Fort and, and getting involved in some adventuring. The six truths of the campaign, the three fronts, that's about it. I think that's pretty simple. I've just added in a couple of maps, sort of some tables from here and there. I just class that as this reskinning of published material because if you're, you know, following this lazy DM approach, you you don't want to be designing too much of this time-consuming stuff from scratch. So you're like you're you're begging, stealing, and borrow borrowing from different sources. <laughs> And that, as they say, is a wrap. Big thanks goes out to you, the listener, for taking a bit of time out of your day to listen to Old Spike Pit. Take care, and I'll catch you later.